talk to us about how the market should prepare for this. Will we see excessive volume compared to normal? What sort of turnover, what sort of size of, of, of trading are we expecting in the last hour of trading? Hi, Caroline. Thanks very much. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, well, look, you know, the, the, the Russell Recon, uh, it's an annual event that's really important for the market because so many people follow the indexes. There's about $9 trillion of assets under management that follow our indexes which means that we need to make sure that they remain a very strong representation, a very robust representation of the markets. And so as the markets change, we go through the process to reconstitute them. So what you should expect to see uh, around the, the close of the market next Friday, when the reconstitution uh, finally comes to fruition, is we should expect to see high volume in the markets. But, you know, we anticipate that that will be an orderly event. This is the 32nd year that we've been working with our partners in the exchanges and doing this reconstitution in conjunction with customers around the world. And it is something that I think the market is well used to. We go through a lot of uh, robust governance to ensure that the changes that we put into effect in the indexes are transparently yeah. uh, provided to customers well in advance. Yeah, I mean, most so people... we went through... Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, most people, uh, as you said, I mean, this is going to be relatively orderly, as they typically tend to be. But we are, we did save these big moves, uh, Walkers, over the past few months in the market. In addition to that, you go back, say, over the past four or five years, where we've seen uh, the makeup and the complexion of the market with regards to the weightings change pretty dramatically. I mean, just looking at sort of what you guys put out uh, last month in, in anticipation of this, we're talking about a Russell 1000 growth index now that's going to have the greatest concentration of companies in your history. And then the value benchmark is also going to have the highest number of stocks ever. Talk to me a little bit about that sort of a factor oligopoly that we seem to have right now in this market between growth and value. Well, I think, you know, we, we expect growth to continue to outperform value. That's a trend that continues. Um, as you mentioned, there's going to be uh, some changes within the style designations that follow from the changes that happen at the Russell reconstitution for the overall indexes. Um, so within the growth, uh, um, the Russell 1000 growth index, you'll see uh, companies like uh, Zoom, Cardinal Health, Datadog, uh, they'll join the Russell 1000 growth index. And then in terms of value, uh, we see Alphabet as the largest addition to the Russell 1000 value in index as it shifts from being 100% growth to having some characteristics of partially uh, in the value space as well. So there will be some changes. Those are in line with how the market dynamics are playing out right now. A curious, you said that you've been doing this for more than 30 years. How does this year compare, given the volatility that we've seen due to the pandemic, how did it make this year maybe more difficult than previous years? Well, the process that we go through is that on uh, May the 8th, we have what we call uh, rank day. And that's when we take a snapshot of the market um, to be able to assess all the various characteristics that go into reconstituting the index. So we look at the market capitalization, for example. We look at various other factors. But generally speaking, the biggest is the, the market capitalization. And then we go through the process um, of uh, assessing how those uh, changes in the market since the last recon last year uh, should be implemented in the, uh, in the rebalance, in the reconstitution. And on June 5th this year, we published uh, the initial preliminary results. So what we do is we go through a process between June 5th and June 26th, next Friday, when the changes come into effect where we're open to queries and challenges from the market. So even though there may be volatility in the market, customers who are using the indexes have a lot of opportunity to engage with us to be able to understand exactly how things are going to work. Mm. And that gives them the opportunity to, uh, if they want to, position their trades in advance of uh, the actual reconstitution day on Friday, June the 26th. Okay, so it's been sort of unprecedented times also for those trying to bring new issues to market the IPOs that we've seen you're saying you're only getting six IPOs entering the Russell 2000 all of them in the healthcare space how do you see that evolving and how does it uh, change the sort of approach you've been taking 
Well, I think we just have to reflect how the the, um, the market is working. That's our job as an index provider is to make sure that the indexes that are used by uh, so many investors around the world to, to gauge the performance of the U.S. equity market in this case um, remain reflective and representative of uh, the, uh, the markets and how they have changed, what the dynamics are in the market. So, yes, you're right that the, um, the healthcare sector um, in uh, when you look at uh, Russell 2000, uh, we have six IPOs only coming in. As you say, they're all healthcare companies. I think that reflects the uh, the trend in the market at uh, at the lower end in terms of small cap. Russell 2000 measures the small caps, so that reflects the trend in the market from the small cap perspective of, of uh, which companies are coming to market with IPOs. And so, uh, when we talk about, I, I want to focus a little bit more also on the small caps because. There has been some concern here that uh, if you don't have the sort of the a weighting that I guess is reflective of the full economy, meaning a weighting that maybe uh, just sort of takes those larger cap companies and that have a great deal of influence on markets themselves, but not necessarily reflective of the broader economic uh, landscape, uh, that it sort of creates disparities and maybe how investors, and I'm talking more uh, longer term investors like pension funds and, and the big sort of portfolio managers, yep. how they sort of allocate and whether they're allocated in a way that's, I guess, uh, fair and reflective of maybe uh, what some of their clients uh, see on the ground on Main Street, so to speak. Yeah, I mean, look, I think that the um, the best representation, therefore, we believe in, in terms of the total market, the total investment opportunity set, if you like, is to take a broad uh, representative benchmark, like the Russell 1000 is the, is the large cap, Russell 2000 gives you the small cap exposure, but if you look at the Russell 3000, that gives you the total market exposure, and that enables investors to be able to tune their investment strategies to where they feel the value opportunities are or the growth opportunities are in the market. Um, the, the Russell indexes uh, also in our family, we incorporate style uh, designations. We talked about value. We talked about growth. Customers are able to then choose which of those indexes in that family uh, suit their investment needs and then um, align their investment portfolios uh, accordingly to, to be able to tune their investment strategies. We were, you know, sort of having a conversation before we were chatting with you about the dominance of companies like Apple with one and a half trillion dollar market cap, Microsoft trying to just get up on, on those heels just right under one and a half trillion dollar market cap. And then we note here, of course, that technology really dominates across the big tech sectors for you. Is there a concern out there that tech maybe is being too weighted? Or is there a sense that in this environment, tech really has proven to be a defensive sector? It has proven to be the company that has a strong balance sheet, and so therefore that market cap is justified. Well, I think, you know, I was listening in earlier on, and you're right. The, the notion here is that the big have got bigger, and uh, at the lower end of the market, the small caps, the small, the small have got smaller. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, this is going to be the first time in the history of all of the Russell U.S. indexes that uh, we have a number of companies that are exceeding a trillion dollars in total market cap, uh, Microsoft, Apple, and Amazon. I think that through the uh, last few months, there's been a lot of discussion, a lot of narrative around the fact that some of those tech companies are well positioned to serve uh, demand um, in the short term um, from, uh, from customers who may be moving to a distributed work-from-home kind of environment, and therefore that resonates with short-term demand. But you have to remember that, you know, what we're trying to represent here in the indexes is the long-term position, long-term representation of how the market has grown over time. Mm. Um, and it's true to say that the, the technology sector, of course, those, some of those biggest companies are in the tech sector and uh, they're the ones that have grown the largest and therefore their market cap is represented in the way the indexes are constituted. Well, because it's amazing in terms of you're saying that we could get some volume towards the end of the trading day, about $9 trillion worth in investment assets are rebalanced, are attuned to your to these sorts of uh, markets and, and have to be reorientated. Do, we so much have seen over the past decade, basically, US win out. Again, every now and then people talk about getting diversified into emerging markets, but really it seems to be that the US equity market is where people wager their bets. Do you think more and more companies and more and more investment funds are setting up to 
align themselves with FTSE Russell? Are we likely to see just U.S. dominance continue and therefore uh, yet more trillions of dollars of assets tied to the rebalancing of your indices? Well, I think you know, the, the customers that we serve are obviously global investors um, and have an outlook that spans across the globe. Our index families incorporate, of course, the Russell indices, which are focused on the U.S. Uh, equity markets, but we have a full range of indices on the uh, indexes on the equity side or the fixed income side that cover global markets, um, developed ones, emerging markets, etc. Um, we see the, uh, the the use of indexes as something overall that is growing in popularity. Um, I think that the use of indexes brings a lot of transparency, uh, a lot of robustness, uh, a lot of information and research and data to the investment process, and that helps, I think, people uh, make better investment decisions, ultimately. I think there's been a continued focus on indexing in the U.S. that uh, is likely to continue. We certainly see that demand from customers um, across the globe that they're focused very much on the U.S. equity market and looking for index solutions there. Sometimes that's, you know, following the Russell indices in terms of market cap. Sometimes that's following the Russell indices in terms of styles, right, growth, value, or even in terms of other factors. Uh, we do a lot of work on the research side mm. uh, to, to build factor-based indices. A big trend that's coming to the market right now, of course, though, is in sustainability, um, ESG. Uh, we get a lot of inquiries from customers who are looking to build variants of the Russell indices or any of our other global exposure indices. Um, which take into account uh, ESG factors or indeed climate risk. You know, we have a lot of models and research going on there, and we're working closely with customers to develop those and help them again to shape their investment portfolios along those lines.